started. Um, so um, my presentation is really about um, you know, why should you care about this software-defined networking open flow thing, and, um, you know, and, and, and in turn, why, why should you care about this uh, project called Genie, the Global Environment for Network Innovation. Um, and I'm going to start by using some slides I did at Statewide. Um, so some of you were there. Uh, so maybe this will be a bit of a repeat, although I'm going to probably go off script on some of these um, based on some things from last week. Um, so real, real quick on that. So last week I was at, uh, and a number of people from IU were at this thing called the Open Networking Summit in, uh, in Palo Alto. Um, which was a, a big sort of event for software-defined networking and open flow. And it was um, you know, a, a lot of people from a lot of different industries, uh, CTOs, VPs of networking, uh, network architects from places like Google and Yahoo and Facebook and Verizon and Deutsche Telekom. And um, you know, the list sort of goes on and on, uh, getting up and talking about why this is so important uh, for their business, for what they do. Um, and why they're so excited about it. Um, so it was kind of a fun week uh, to listen to all those people, get to talk to all those people. Um, so there's really a lot of momentum behind this, um, which is kind of fun. So hopefully through the course of the day, you'll actually get to play with some of the stuff, see how it works, uh, and hopefully you'll also be uh, excited about this stuff. Uh, so here's sort of an outline of what I'll talk about. Um, so software-defined networking is really just picking up on, I think, on some trends that are already happening. And I'll, I'll talk about what some of those are and the architecture and some of the basics. I'll try to um, move through some of that. So we have Chris coming in, right, Steve, to talk about um, the, the... So I'll try not to spend too much time on, on the OpenFlow stuff because some of that will be uh, repeat. And then talk about sort of why this is important for universities um, in particular. Um, and a little bit about what we're doing about it. Um, so, you know, the drivers for software-defined networking. So, you know, starting, I don't know, probably three or four years ago, pretty much all the vendors that will come in and want to talk to us started wanting to talk pretty much exclusively about data centers. And, you know, and I heard data center, data center, data center. And um, it's like, hmm, why, why, why this focus on, on data centers? Yeah, can you, and, uh, and, and what's this about? I mean, of course, we're doing virtualization in our data center. Things are changing, but it's not like, you know, it's uh, you know, some m massive part of our infrastructure. Um, you know, our challenges are not necessarily uh, just within the data center. Um, and, and then I uh, started learning about these sort of massively large warehouse scale data centers. And actually, I had a chance to go to Facebook um, last Thursday night. They had an open house. Um, and their infrastructure team got up and talked about the scale at which they deal with. Um, I have some quotes from the guy from Yahoo, which is probably equal scale. Um, but but the, the, the Facebook talk was, was quite interesting. Um, they, have, um, they can provision a 10,000 node cluster, 10,000 servers in 10 minutes. They can turn up, turn up from point of physically complete install to fully production software build. Uh, 10,000 servers in 10 minutes. Um, their web caches get over a billion hits a second. They have more than a petabyte of new content uplo uploaded every week. Could you imagine adding a petabyte of storage to your network every single week? Um, it's kind of mind-boggling um, the scales that these people are dealing with. It's just more than really I can fathom. Uh, the network guy said, you know, their, their uh, aggregate traffic load in the 18 to 24 months he's been working there has gone up eightfold, right? Um, he said, you know, just they build a network design for a data center and three months later it's out of date um, because their traffic has doubled um, since, you know, they designed it. Um, just really incredible scale, really incredible growth. And sort of that's why the focus on these sort of large-scale data centers. So uh, from what I had in my talk was this, this talk from this guy, uh, Igor Gashinsky, who I met this week. Um, uh, he did a talk at Interop in the spring. Um, so and he did a similar talk this week again uh, about their data, new data center in upstate New York. Phase one of that data center, 120,000 physical servers, 2.4 million virtual machines. And phase one of one of their data centers, the Facebook... Facebook doesn't use um, 
vir virtualization actually they, they at all on their servers but they have um, sort of uh, equivalent scale they, they showed their new data center in, in North Carolina which is actually three football fields in size it's one of multiple buildings that they're building on that site um, and so you know equivalent scale uh, for, for their data centers but without virtualization but 2.4 million VMs in phase one of one of their data centers um, if you if you sort of extrapolate that, that to how many switches, if you're looking at somewhere between 20 to 40 servers in Iraq, um, you're looking somewhere between three to 6,000 Ethernet switches um, in phase one of one of their data centers. So so these large providers, uh, you know, Facebook has six or seven of these data centers in North America. Um, you know, they're looking on orders of 25 to 30,000 Ethernet switches um, that they have to manage just in North America. Uh, so the scales are, are getting just incredibly massive. Um, and so if you look at, you know, what are, what are the challenges of this? Well, how do you scale network management, right? Well, there's no way you can individually configure 30,000 devices in any way, shape, or form. This just doesn't happen anymore. There's no logging in to individual switches in the top of rack to, 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 to make configuration changes. That stuff really has to be automated. Um, Man, the, the, these multi-tenant data centers um, like Yahoo with that many VMs and being able to move VMs around, if you think of uh, Amazon EC2, and people come in and provision a few VMs, and they want to, you know, some months later provision some more VMs, you know, they kind of want those new VMs to be on the same VLAN as the first VMs they provisioned. Well, if you have that sort of hyper growth, what's the chance that you're going to be able to put those new VMs in the same portion of the data center. If you think 2.4 million virtual machines, 2.4 million MAC addresses in phase one of one data center, right? A typical switch can only hold 64,000 MAC addresses at most. So divide 2.4 million by 64,000, you have a lot of uh, pods where you can have layer two mobility within those. So if you're moving and growing that fast, how do you make sure that the next set of VMs that someone wants to provision is in the same pod? is the first set they provisioned. It's nearly impossible. Um, so something really has to happen in terms of, of layer two scaling for, for mobility. Um, you know, bandwidth scaling, a lot of people talking about you know, east-west traffic, and so Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop uh, uh, storage clustering thing is, is sort of the big driver of that. And I don't, I'm not a Hadoop expert by any means, but my understanding is when you, when you build sort of a Hadoop cluster, there is a lot of internode traffic within the cluster. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but Facebook talked about the size of the Hadoop clusters they build, and it, it's really quite massive. Um, and so you sort of have hundreds or thousands of servers that all need to have lots of traffic back and forth um, between each other. So instead of your traffic leaving the server and going back out to the internet to your client, it's moving you know across your data center this way. And so when you're building these two-tier or three-tier data center structures that typically have 4x or 10x over subscription, you know, that doesn't really work anymore. Um, when you have these Hadoop clusters. Um, a lot of people this week talking about control plane scaling. So when you have that many MAC addresses, um, these are very well documented, very well um, managed networks, right? If you think about building a network of that size, there's a database that has all the information about where every server is, what its MAC address is. You know, the inventory database is just very meticulously maintained to make this happen. The point is, why do my switches have to continually, every 60 seconds or every couple minutes, every couple hours, have to keep learning where all the MAC addresses in the data center are? And so the amount of, um, gosh, I forget who said this. So, so they estimated that 35% of the CPU cycles on their switches were just being devoted to learning new MAC addresses. So at that scale, that many MAC addresses learned, 35% of the CPU cycles just to learn the MAC addresses. You gotta learn every five minutes. You have 64,000 addresses to learn. It's just spending all its time learning MAC addresses. And the point was, why the heck do my switches have to keep learning MAC addresses over and over and over and over when I have a database that knows exactly where every single one of those is at? That just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, flexibility. So, you know, whether they're using OpenStack or, or Eucalyptus or any number of other provisioning systems, you know, their compute and their storage are highly flexible and programmable. It's really easy to spin up new servers, new storage, 
um, all through these uh, um, software, these APIs that, that, that these companies have built to do this. Like I said, turning up a 10,000 node cluster in 10 minutes. Completely automated um, software install, testing, turn up the whole nine yards, right? Their network, on the other hand, requires some guy to go through every one of those switches and log into it and configure it by hand, basically. Some of them have tools to do that, but it's very difficult, as I think a lot of you know, to, to build tools.